I want to talk to you about the true villain of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Willy Wonka. Oh, go on. From the song Pure Imagination, and I quote, If you want to view paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want to, do it. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. Then they go ahead and do what he tells them to, and all of a sudden, they're screwed. Yes, they fall through trap doors, or they get shot out of a chocolate cannons. Yeah. Incidentally, this world of pure imagination is not that. It is a world of real-life dangerous <laughs> machinery. All those children, they may be assholes, but they deserve compensation for their medical expenses and a lifetime supply of chocolate. It was actually part of the deal that they would get a lifetime supply of chocolate, but then he made them fill out that contract. Oh, and the you contract. know someone's a villain when you're filling out a contract that you can't read. That is a devil's bargain every single time. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Tonight's movie was directed by a Hollywood legend whose work has never appeared on our show. I'll give you three guesses as to who you think that director is. Howard Hawks. No. Francis Ford Coppola. No. Arthur Schlesinger. <laughs> You were close with number two. The director is John Ford. Ah. The man has a huge filmography. I've only seen a handful of his films, so it's hard to pick which one to watch. So I decided to go with the weirdest title. Visiting hours have begun for the prisoner of Shark Island. Oh. Oh, that John Ford movie. <laughs> there are many times I think, man, why haven't I seen the prisoner of Shark Island yet? Released in 1936, this film stars Warren Baxter, Gloria Stewart, you might know her as the old lady in Titanic. Or the young lady in The Prisoner of Shark Island. And notable Hollywood patriarch, John Carradine. A 60-minute adaptation of this film was broadcast on the CBS Radio Network program Lux Radio Theater on May 2nd, 1938 with Gary Cooper in the lead role. I don't like Gary Cooper. Why? He's laconic. You know, he's a laconic actor, and laconic basically means boring person who's pretty enough to be on film. That's all laconic means. Like Randolph Scott. Laconic. <laughs> I have not seen any John Ford movies this early. This is kind of before he got into the heavy western period. So yeah, I want to see what the boy can do. Well, I think you'll find tonight's gift entirely appropriate. Ah! <laughs> well, get on the boat. Untie the boat. Paddle the boat off into the water until you reach the shores of the old leather couch where we will watch the prisoner of Shark Island. You know, I'd much rather be a prisoner of Fire Island. Those guys know how to party. <laughs> it's April 9th, 1865. The war is over. We're burning down the South. Throwing away all of our, our war wood. President Lincoln gives a speech. All right, listen up, people. I'm your president. There's one piece of music I've always liked. In a God of Vita. <laughs> All 18 minutes of it. I asked the band to play Dixie. Oh, no, you didn't. I get off my lawn. <laughs> now that that's over, Lincoln goes to the theater. We have a little bit of the popular favorite, our American cousin. Lincoln's loving it. <laughs> Nothing going on back here. Lincoln is very distracted right now. He can't concentrate on the play. He's imagining something called the Secret Service. <laughs> His theater experience is cut short by a young actor named John Wilkes Booth, who shoots him dead. I've seen this. What? I've seen this scene. Sink, simper, Booth escapes into the night. Don't die. Andrew Johnson will be a horrible president. <laughs> In the country, we meet Samuel Mudd and his wife, Peggy. They're living their doctor country and... Country doctor, wife. <laughs> when there's a knock at the door. His leg's broken. Can you, can you do something for him? I don't know. I, that scarf makes him look like a villain. Dr. Booth, Dr. Booth. Dr. Mudd says, well, of course I'll treat him. I'm a doctor. I, uh, I'm a good man. He's going to cut off the boot so that he can get to the leg. And it's revealed that he's John Wilkes Booth. Booth makes every attempt to hide his identity. Oh, dear. Get some brandy, will you? I'm going to set this leg. But first I got to get good and drunk. More brandy. <laughs> you think you can stand it? Ew, this is Christian Brothers brandy. <laughs> Ugh. 
Dr. Mudd sets the broken leg. Now, this is going to help to ease that pain. It's a sedative. Said to give? He gives Dr. Mudd Fifty dollars. The Muds start dreaming their little dreams. So I'll just make this his lucky day and pay him fifty dollars. I'm going to write a play about this very night. It's called Fifty Dollars. <laughs> <laughs> the army is scouring the countryside looking for Booth, the assassin. Who lives up that road? Dr. Mud. Samuel A. Mud. Never done a bad thing in his whole life. Lifelong hero and he's going to die that way. <laughs> There's some mud there. That's his trademark. <laughs> we, we know he's been through here. But, 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 but. A cranky old man is eating breakfast. I tell you, it was not the question of slavery. Mm, I don't cotton to it. That is Dr. Mudd's father-in-law. She hasn't got up yet. Why? He's out. Huh? Who's sick now? At Roosevelt, I think. A what? W would you mind leaving the room for a minute? Why? I need to spout a string of profanities. <laughs> Mudd's little daughter finds a discarded boot and she says oh this will be a fun thing to play with this is a pl game i play called dolly boot one of the soldiers looks at it and sees that there's a name inside the boot it's john wilkes booth's boot now mud's in big trouble you're as good as any white man wait a minute who gave you permission to come on my land and take my hands away from the work you can't bluff me mud you're a slaver hey neighbor your debts are paid because you don't pay for labor Dr. Mudd is under arrest for conspiracy in the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Later on, Booth is shot dead while resisting arrest, and eight alleged co-conspirators are brought into court. David E. Hell! Sean Penn? Eli Wallach? Crazed Hobo? Edgar Allan Poe? <laughs> Strother Martin? Trotsky. <laughs> Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. I would love it if in the middle of this trial, bursting into the room, was a head-bandaged Lincoln. <laughs> Be like, I'm fine. <laughs> All the judges are given express orders to try to put aside anything that might be called reasonable doubt. Because men of the sword can be hard. We shall not be limp. We shall be turgid. <laughs> I want you to hear that voice. <laughs> Peas and carrots! Good night, Sam, darling. My heart will go on. He is found guilty, and he says farewell to his family. Yes, ma'am, you can talk to our prisoner in the room where we keep all the guns. <laughs> he will not be hanged. He will merely be condemned to life imprisonment at Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas. It doesn't look that dry. Yeah, it's surrounded by water. How dry can it be? And for a man named Mud, living in a dry place would truly be hell. He'd have to change his name to Samuel Dust. Look down, look down, don't look them in the eye. Look down, look down, you're here until you die. Step, step! Gentlemen, what we have here is a completely successful attempt to communicate. <laughs> He meets Sergeant Rankin, the commandant of the prison, and he certainly doesn't like Booth. And he certainly doesn't like Mud. I keep calling him Booth. It's not Booth, it's Mud. Says, welcome to hell, man. Look at him! Watch him get what's coming to him! Even as a young man, John Carradine was an old man. <laughs> now, before we go any further here... I'd like to say... Bah, 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 bah. Sergeant Rankin takes the prisoners out to the moat that surrounds the fort. John Carradine's face could slice bread. <laughs> hey, check it out. Look, you guess what we got in that moat? Sharks. I guess that would make this Shark Island. This song always makes me sleepy. <laughs> Oh, see, that's uh, why they call it taps. I tap your shoulder and you wake up. Nice. Yep. His old pal, which is a southern way of saying slave, Buck, has become a guard here at Dry Tortuga. Buck, move on, white man. And Buck ignores him. That was the first time I met out Dr. Samuel Mudd. <laughs> Looked like a stiff wind would blow him over. There's a knock on the cell bars. It's Buck. I'm on your side. I just can't act like it during daytime hours. 
You see, Mudd's family is working on proving his innocence and exonerating him. Uh, the judge is a Yankee, but he's on Yeah, yeah, I'm a judge, judge. Yeah, all we have to do is get him to Key West, and then we can get another trial started. But Dr. Mudd's not in Key West. Yet. It's nearly spring break, and he's sure to turn up there. We're going to spring him in the middle of the night with the help of Buck. Sergeant Rankin is suspicious. What's outside? A bunch of water and stuff. Bunch of junk. Buck puts a key in a bar of soap. I don't know, but I've been told I'm a prisoner in Toro Tortuga. <laughs> Mud attempts a daring escape. Sergeant Rankin says, shoot to kill. Shoot on sight. If I see him, I will. I'll have to blind them all using my doctor powers. He climbs a wall. He's trying to get out of here. Everybody's shooting at Mud up on the wall, and he gets hit, and he falls into the shark pit. But it's not that easy because of the sharks. <laughs> the sharks are going to get him. Yeah, shoot at him too. We'll kill him twice. With that barrage on the water, you're lucky if you've got a shark left in a hundred yards of this spot. Because that's how you scare sharks, don't you know? Mud gets out into the open sea. Mud's out, out of the prison. prison. Ba, 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 ba. Mud's off, off Shark Island. Island. He makes it to the boat. Uh, what's the password? <laughs> what? Password? Mud, you're finally free. No, he's not. Concern it, someone's shooting at my boat. It must be a Yankee. <laughs> Sergeant Rankin boards the ship, and he takes Mud back to prison. And he throws him in solitary confinement. The shoe, or wh whatever you want to call it. Swim out into the ocean, try to escape on a boat, you spend a night in a box. They call me Dr. Mud. Good morning, how are you? I'm Dr. Mud. I'm innocent of crimes. I am a real Dr. Mud. <laughs> Yellow fever sweeps the island. Everyone's getting sick. Dr. McIntyre, he gets the yellow fever too. There's a boat offshore. Tell the captain of that ship I've got to have those supplies. I'm throwing a supplies party. <laughs> yeah, wonk, wonk. People are suffering. They need the medicine. They need the food. He just said, ah! <laughs> <laughs> If only there was another doctor on the island. Doctor, I am here on a curious mission. I found a treasure map. Desperate. Mud says, I'll do it because I'm still a doctor. God damn it. He doesn't use those words. And Mud goes to work. You give the orders. I'll take the responsibility, Doctor. All right, sir. Order number one, free me from this island. <laughs> Order number two, go to hell. <laughs> Here comes the storm. Hi, <laughs> soldier. Oh, you, punch. Dr. Mud also gets yellow fever. And how long do you think I'm going to last? Forever? Forever, ever, forever, ever, <laughs> forever, ever. We need those doctors that are on that boat. We need those supplies. And the way I can do it is by firing cannons at the boat. We need to scare that ship into coming into shore. The boat comes in. They get the needed medical supplies. You know what, Dr. Mud? You ain't such a bad egg after all. I wrote this letter recommending Mud's pardon. Back at home, Peggy and the little baby are waiting for Daddy to come home. Thank you, Mom, Sam. Please stop calling me master. It feels weird now. Daddy, you smell like Tortuga. And Buck gets to go home too. Rosabelle and all 12 of his children. And it's a happy ending for the prisoner of Shark Island. Leave hope behind who enters here. The prisoner of the Shark Island. Of the Shark Island? <laughs> Put an extra the. <laughs> the prisoner of Shark Island. I was hoping for more sharks. There were not a lot of sharks. Yeah. Here's the thing I wanted to tell you about the assassination scene. Yeah? I saw that scene on TV when I was a very young child. I thought that that was a film of the actual assassination. John Ford is that good. I didn't understand that they didn't have cameras back during yeah. Lincoln's time. And I re probably really didn't know where Lincoln was in history. Oh, that's how it went. Yeah. Wow, I can't, I can't, it's amazing they captured this. <laughs> Something about the assassination, John Wilkes Booth knew the play Our American Cousin really, really well. He knew what the biggest laugh line of the play was. Okay. I'll shoot him then. So no one heard the gunshot go off. 
and when he got to the stage, people were like, oh, look, it's John Wilkes Booth. He's in this play, too? <laughs> As a prison movie, it was pretty good. Yeah. As a historical document, I'm sure it was very much sensationalized. Now, you're a big fan of presidents. We've discussed mm -hmm. this before. Yes. How was this as a president movie? They made Nixon uh, like a, a very strong character. Nixon? I'm tired, man. <laughs> they, they made Lincoln a very strong character in just a few broad strokes. Speaking of Lincoln, uh, John Carradine, who plays Sergeant Rankin in this, he actually auditioned to play the role of Lincoln. But as Sergeant Rankin, he's quite good. Mm -hmm. Just the body language he uses, the way he moves, he looks like a praying mantis. Yeah, and he looks like someone who's been confined to this island. That's something, when, when you have a prison colony type thing... All the guards are prisoners as well. Yeah. And that's something that shines through with him. There was a lot of racial politics in this movie. Yes. Was it troubling? You just been telling us that we're as good as you is. That was a little bit birth of a nation-y. It's always tricky with John Ford. There's a but, little bit of humor yeah. at the expense of what was then regarded as the black persona, but it's not terrible. Ford got better as time went on. Yeah. By the 50s and 60s, he had an idea of how to make a black character seem like a human being. Ford is known for his landscapes. I have seen Young Mr. Lincoln, and I'm not a fan of that movie, and that's a very interior movie. Lots of courtroom scenes and things along those lines. And there's nothing that feels confined like John Ford inside. While this movie, he has larger rooms to play with. And so that he was better at figuring out ways to play with the scene to make the rooms look larger. One of the scenes that I really liked was the hanging scene. What they showed you was almost as horrifying as if they showed you the actual people being hung. Grown men hiding behind their hats. Yeah, soldiers it, yeah. who just got out of a pretty vicious war being like, I don't want to watch this. Yeah. What did you think of Gloria Stewart? Not much. And she didn't have much to do. Even in 36, her acting style seemed very old-fashioned. It was just a very one-note performance. Mm -hmm. When you read the title, The Prisoner of Shark Island, what did you think the movie would be about? I just thought it would be <clears throat> a crazy movie with sharks. <laughs> That's what I thought it was going to be, too. Well, those sharks were not very effective. I recommend they get rid of them and they bring in some electric eels or perhaps a giant squid. And all would dread being a prisoner of Squid Island. Calamari's on the menu tonight. You're on the calamari's menu tonight. That's what I meant. You are sentenced to visit our website. Welcome to thebasementshow.com. On there is all kinds of cool stuff, and there's a PayPal donation button. You can donate to support our show. It only takes a couple of dollars to set a broken leg. And to support our show. One of our donors is Nicole, and you remember she wrote us a while back saying that she was going to lock herself in her office and watch all of our episodes. Well, did she live? She writes, update, I did survive, and I'm up to date on the series. All That Jazz is one of my all-time favorite episodes. I thank you, and so does Stu! And now it's time... For seen it. Sick, simper, seen it. What are sharks? Sharks are animals, just like you and me, and so our theme tonight is animals. Daniel Simonetti Racy asks, Hey guys, what about Groundhog Day by Harold Ramis? Have you seen it? Yes, I have. Seen it. I always argue that comedy should be nominated for Best Picture. This is one that really should have been nominated. He's not an asshole because he's a bad guy. He just hasn't found the thing about life that's going to fill him up. And whether he's there for 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 years doing the same day over and over again, he earns your love. Also appearing in that movie, Michael Shannon. Oh, his yes. first film performance. I feel like we've talked about this before because this conversation sounds very familiar. Are you sure you're not just living this day over and over again, Matt? Graham Kondo writes... I bawled my eyes out when I saw The Elephant Man for the first time. Seen it. Seen it just recently. I saw that movie when it used to play constantly on HBO or the movie channel back when I was a kid. I think it's something that made me stronger spiritually to watch this um, very sad movie. One of the saddest movies ever made. Uh, over and over again. John Hurt's acting performance of this is spectacular, of course, but I think the real star is Anthony Hopkins, who gives a really deep performance, but he has this scientific detachment that adds this whole different layer to it. 
the scene where he first sees the elephant man at the carnival. He's weeping, but you can tell that he's not weeping because he's sad or that he feels sympathy. It's because he's seeing something he's never seen for the very first time. And he's weeping as a scientist. Yeah. And, and you can tell that. And we're so used to seeing Hopkins post-Lecter, where he has that little bit of cartoon and everything that he does. And so to see a young Hopkins playing a very real person. It is a David Lynch movie, through and through. The soundscapes of Eraserhead definitely find a home in this movie. And you see a context for it. There's the steam machines of 1800s Britain. The dehumanized world and this very human monster. Sure. Good old Lynch. Sitting in your pocket. Gonna get you right now. (laughs) David Lynch is sitting in your pocket, and he's going to get you right now. (laughs) Sean M. Vale writes, Grizzly Man had been meaning to see it since it came out. Just wow. Seen it. Seen it. This is the story of Timothy Treadwell, who was a troubled man. Mm -hmm. He would go out every summer to mingle with the Grizzlies. And he got away with it until he didn't. One summer he stayed too long, the Grizzlies got hungry, and he paid the price. And unfortunately, so did his girlfriend. Yes. That's the real tragic part of it. It's a beautiful movie. It's uh, in a lot of ways inspirational, but at the same time, it's terrifying. You find out in this movie that Treadwell was the second choice to play Woody on Cheers. <laughs> That's the Could have changed his whole life. And then Woody Harrelson would be up there being devoured. Now, you've talked in the past about your annoyance with documentarians who put themselves into the documentary. Yes, I do have that problem. And this is what Werner Herzog has been doing for quite some time. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes Herzog's inserting himself into the documentary work is that he is the opposite of Timothy Treadwell. Treadwell trusted nature to a tragic degree. Herzog Herzog has had decades of contempt for nature. He hates nature. (laughs) (laughs) So he's trying to understand this man that he has nothing in common with. I think nature... It's base and vile. I've been working on my Herzog. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good one. When man goes into the jungle, sometimes he comes out without his soul. Grizzly man. You see Herzog put on those headphones, and he listens to the tape of Treadwell getting killed by the bear. Yes. And the first thing you think is, I want to hear that. Mm-hmm. And then you think, what does that mean about me? Then it really... Makes you immediately look at yourself. Michael C. writes, Have you seen Un Chien Andalou? And if you have, what are your thoughts on it? Seen it! You were the loud to my quiet. Yes, I was. Right. I'm going to tell you what I think it means first, and then you can correct me. I don't think it means anything. This is to cinema what Dadaism was to art. There's no doubt it's a story. It's got characters, it's got a setting, it's got a relationship, it's got violence, it has sex, it has meditations on death, but I don't think the individual parts of it really mean anything. It's just meant to tear down your idea of what a film is or what a story is. You're right. Oh, thank you. That's exactly what Boonwell and Dolly were going for. You can see it as like, well, this is a guy who's a sexually repressed young man seeing this woman, and he's dragging two priests behind him because that's the guilt of (laughs) Catholicism. Blah, blah, blah. It's just a dream story. And just the sheer joy of cinema. That's seen it. And that's our show. We watched The Prisoner of Shark Island. All of his trials and tribulations are now behind him, and he's no longer a prisoner of Shark Island. Ah. At the end of this episode, you can see a link to our previous episode, in case you missed it, and also a link to our Season 6 playlist. To go further back than that, you can go to welcometothebasementshow.com and see every episode we've ever done. We hope you'll join us again for our next episode. It is going to be an entirely different movie, because if we watch The Prisoner of Shark Island again, that would be kind of dumb. That would throw off the entire premise of the show. Good night. Good night. Tonight's movie was directed by a true Hollywood legend. I'll give you three guesses as to who you think that is. Henry Jaglum. No. Carl Perkins. No. Fanny Ford Mopola. Those were the worst guesses you could ever have guessed. Particularly Henry Jaglum. Sink, simple,